much for um, you know waking up early and coming. I know it's eight o'clock in the morning on your side, and here and in Melbourne, which it's four o'clock in the afternoon. So yes, thank you very much for gracing the event. Um, I, I understand that you're all you know doing a seminar as well on your side, and I would like to welcome you all to our class, which is um, well the class is, is called Cities Without Slums. And we have been, um, this is our third day of our class seminar. And we're really thankful for, you know, for having this opportunity to actually have a conversation with um, uh, your organization. That's really great for, for giving us this, this opportunity. So maybe we can um, have you introduce um, yourself to us. And then we can maybe give, each one could have probably like, five minutes or um, a few minutes to explain, you know, where they came from, their background, and yeah, and tell us about um, more about yourself, and then we can go on from there. Okay, so we'll do a, a lightning round introduction. We have a really big team, so let's just say our names and our organization, and then we'll give a little bit more information about what we do as we go into the presentation. So my name is Sky Dobson and I work with the SDI Secretariat here in Cape Town. Hi, my name is Charlton Zilfoto and I work for the Sports Show for the Community Organization Resource Center, which has a national program in South Africa supporting the Federation of the ISP. Hi, my name is Dodeni Tengo. I'm the social uh, movement working with ISM in KZN. Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Melanie Johnson and I come from a community called Melinda and I represent the Infomox Settlement Network, shortly ISM. Afternoon, my name is Chazama Nonga. I'm coming from the National <coughs> Federation of the Urban Fraud Poor. I'm the coordinator of the Western Cape Federal. Good morning, my name is Chonoka Kwele. I stay in a former settlement called Taiwan in Kailisha here in South Africa, Western Cape. I'm, social, I'm coming from the social movement for the creation of the Equal Rural Group. Morning, my name is Anna Eshlevao. I'm from Durban. I'm a coordinator of the creation of Urban and Rural Poor in KZN. I represent the city of. Thank you. Afro, would you like to say hi? <laughs> Hi, uh, Sarah Watson, the integrated municipality. Well, if I got on the back, we do. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rosie Oakley, I'm in Cape Town, uh, Alicia Nita. Hi, I'm Ivan Gallego, I'm from Oscar Hans from the integrated municipality. Good afternoon, Australia. <laughs> uh, my name is Blessing Mojita, and I'm also with Hope for me, for my presenter, Southmati. I am in Peda in Community Data Collection and GIS. Thank you. Hi, hello, guys. My name is Mutuane Resulu. I'm a community leader from Close Global. I'm responsible for supporting the former segments and then the creation in the process of facilitating uh, communities and uh, doing a play of the forest. Good morning. I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm here to talk about one of the other support.
talking about community um, community led slum upgrading. Yeah, so take it away, Sky. I'll just leave our um, our speaker. Okay, so uh, community led upgrading. I think we have quite a lot to say about that. Um, we have an amazing group of people here to give some insights to you. I know we have only a little bit of time. So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask a few questions to the team so that you can get a sense of, of what we do through their answers. Uh, I think you've been reading up, I think you watched a video even today of uh, Sheila Patel, right? The board chairperson of SDI. Not, your, not if you watched that, yes, okay. <laughs> and then I think you've also read some materials. So you don't need background on SDI. So we'll just go into some question and answer with the team that are here. So the first question I have is, women-led savings groups are often called the building blocks of SDI. Why is this the case, Madam Tozama? Maybe you can say what saving group you're part of also. I'm part of a saving group called Sisuga in Makaza. Uh, when we are talking about saving groups or women-led saving groups, we are talking about organized women. And, uh, and they also alleviate poverty within their community. And there's nothing we can do without having anything. Our development that we are doing, we have to have something. And to go to the municipality or to our government without anything in our hands, we have to present something and say, we are asking for this, but we also contribute towards our development. And how many savings groups do you have in, in Cape Town? We have a around 39 saving groups in Cape Town, with uh, 2,638 members. And how did the savings groups come together to make the federation? We started uh, saving groups in, 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 different, uh, in different communities, whereby we go into a community and talk to women about savings. And then we nature that group, when they start that group, we nurture it, and it becomes a saving group, and then they open their own account, and then they put in money in their own account. But we supported them all the way until they reach a maturity stage where they, whereby they can do anything on their own. Thanks, Tozama. Then after these communities get organized into federations or informal settlement networks, then they start doing something called profiling, enumeration, and mapping. Um, Blessing, can you talk uh, to us a little bit about how this works and why it's important for communities to gather information on their setup? Okay, then start. Um, let me just come a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, do you hear me, guys, over there? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, as I said in the introduction, <laughs> I support communities in information gathering, uh, which we call uh, community enumerations and settlement profiling. So the main important aspect in this activity is that um, it is more like the cornerstone of uh, SDI, that is what I can say, in terms of organizing communities. Um, goes with the data collection that is done by community members. It's um, more of a a little bit sophisticated exercise, but when it comes to the community members, we capacitate them in such a way that they understand the whole process and they run it themselves. So the main important thing is that um, with this data collection, it provides more of um, accurate information about this informal settlement because the information is collected by them as residents of that settlement. So they try by all means to collect all the necessary information without any problems. Um, so in the process of uh, data collection, it helps the community to understand themselves in terms of service delivery and also the ratios of services in their settlement and the populations. So at the end of the day, the community tends to understand uh, its own demographic status, that is the population, population, uh, population age groups and all that. So with that uh, data collection exercise, it is also coupled with uh, GIS mapping, where we map each and every structure, and then we link the information on enumeration, that is on the household survey, 
then we link to the structures that we have through the GIS system. So at the end of the day, we don't just get uh, statistics of the settlements, but all this process also helps in the mobilization of communities. Because as soon as you get into their households collecting information, they would like to follow up and understand what exactly is going to come out of their information. So in that way, the community feels more mobilized than it's it suddenly becomes the base of any form of development or upgrading that is going to be done in the community. Because all the numbers, all the statistics that we get, they become, like as I said, the base in terms of knowing how many structures are there, how many families are there. So at the end of it, we don't just call it an enumeration, a, a, a settlement enumeration, but also a people collecting process. This exercise of enumeration helps to bring people together and understand the whole processes as they unfold. And also it helps them to come up um, or in, in a process or in an approach that we use, which is called a participatory approach. So involving them, uh, community members in the data collection, it helps them to, to, to participate and understand the whole process from the beginning up to the end. So in this way, we intend to take away the aspect of uh, community members seeing themselves as passive recipients, whereby they will just sit and relax and wait for whoever the stakeholder is coming to do things for them. But in this case, it helps them to be part and parcel of whatever is done in their community, from data collection, planning, implementation, and existence in the settlement. Thank you very much, I think. Okay, very good. Yeah. Thank you, Blessing. Can I, can I put in Julia on the spot just quickly to ask to give us a practical example of how this profiling and remuneration has helped um, any community in Cape Town? Sorry, Jamele. You. <laughs> I, 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 thank you very much. You, I wasn't ready, but I, as, as, as a soldier, I have to, to respond to the question. I think it is, it is very important for this information. I'll make a, a, a very quick reference. In my community where I come from, we in 2009, in fact, just before 2009, there were speculations in the community that there's about 20 to 25,000 people that were residing in Trostov. And when we came across the SDI family, we were able to zoom into that directly, and we found out that there was only about 10,000 uh, people in the community, which, um, was very good for the community because the intention of government was to relocate all the people of Joe Slovo to Daft. Then after we've done that um, enumeration and profiling in that settlement, they were able to do development in situ. As we speak from 2011, we are doing in situ upgrading. I understand there are a number of challenges that are taking place. We are supposed to have been done with that development, but there are a lot of other challenges that we are facing. But the development is underway. There is a lot of other projects that are taking place um, what I wanted to add on what Blessing was saying yesterday was that after all these processes taken place in terms of um, um, equipping and capacitating these communities in terms of collecting and working them together, you take that to another level where we are engaging with the cities, engaging in such that we are able to, to, to bring some development to, to communities and communities, as you are saying, at the center of their own development. It is very much helpful for communities. At, at, at some point when we were engaging with communities when we started this whole process, you would ask the leaders at community level as to, in your leadership or in your community, how many people are there in terms of the population? The leadership would be scratching the head, not knowing the total number of people in the community. You ask about the services. How many water taps do you have? How many toilets do we have in your community? Community leadership would be scratching head, not knowing what exactly is available in their community. This is how then this process was helpful to our communities, including our community leaders. Thank you very much. So, many, many of the federations and informal settlements were formed, informal settlement networks were formed because of the issue of addiction, like Ms. Bonelli was saying. Why is it so important for communities to come together and to work toward incremental and institute upgrading? Firstly, when informal settlements come together, it's basically to build solidarity around the issues 
such as floods, fires, evictions, and all, all the issues that are basically faced with the informal settlement. So when we come together, it's not just looking at what the issues are, but also saying, you know, we are tired of waiting for government for this adequate house. How can we change the living conditions while we actually wait? Because we are facing all of these challenges. And when they look at what the settlement looks like, we are saying, how do we actually support you in developing your, developing your community plan, which changes your living conditions for now, such as looking at fires, floods, looking at structures, looking at access roads, and all of those things. So I think when the communities basically come together, it's about identifying what the needs are, and understanding that the needs won't be assisted now, because government has a big, long list, and they won't get to settlements now, maybe in the next 10 to 20 years. But how can we change the living conditions where they are? And change it in, in, in a way where it's livable, where it's dignified, where you can actually build, uh, build people to build a community. And in that sense, it's not only communities, because communities can't also do it on their own, but also how do they bring in government, how do they bring in different stakeholders, so that, so that they can actually have better services. Because the issues around informal settlements are, are a lot about basic services, it's a lot about land tenure, it's about how do we do things for ourselves by saying we are hopeless and we are poor, but we can do things for ourselves. In general, I have another yeah, this, is, this yeah. is the last one, just to share with the team that we, we've, got, we've got a responsibility of sensitizing these communities. We're using our slogans. So we share these slogans with you, the team there. Yeah, so these are our So these are our slogans that we are applying to bring people Together. When we say Amanda, we stay in power, and people are responding and saying it's, um, it's money and knowledge. Then again, when we say Ukotela Bangabuti, when we say Ukotela Bangabuti, we say the coffee of this brother, and we respond, we say this is bringing suspicion. So we all just bring people together so that they love in the process and they are able to engage on these issues. Also, we say, here there is this idiotic man that is um, eating sweets without killing them. So this is the process that we're saying to people, you must make sure that you are protected when you are using these things in the right. Thank you. I think that was great. You get a bit of a flavor of what this, this organization is all about. Huh? So I, I think the, the issue of institute operating in South Africa, perhaps more than any of the other countries that we, that we work in, is so critical because there's been a, a history of people being moved out to the urban periphery for these uh, housing projects and whatnot. So the, the SA Alliance has been working very hard to look at different solutions for upgrading in situ. So let's move on to, and speaking of this, we've been the last few days here, we've been with the, the Federation and Informal Settlement Network from Durban and Cape Town, and also the Federation from Accra, and they've been here with their uh, city government officials. Sometimes it's viewed that slum dwellers, shack dwellers, they're at war with their local government. But uh, I want to ask Mamka Bella, why is SDI and why do you think it's important for your federation to partner with government? Okay. Slums are often considered to be at war with local government, but SDI slum dwellers are not fighting their local government because we are negotiating, because we are organized. So we don't just go on the street and march. We don't march, we talk on the table. We come, we make appointments, and then we talk to the local government. That's why, as it is, we are forming partners with our local government because we are negotiating with them. We present who we are, and then they understand us better, and we got information as our, our partners were presenting. We've got the information on our hands. We believe you cannot just sit and wait for somebody to do things for, your, for you. We are doing things for ourselves. No, we are 
putting something on the table to say, let's meet halfway and do our, what we think is, the better, is, is better for us. And as slum dwellers, we don't just want any development. We want to prioritize our development in our informal sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rebecca, does this mean that you always have the same opinion as government or that you are always getting along well in your partnership or are there some challenges? Yes, there are always challenges when you're facing the government. Because we have always been on the same, on the same side. That's why we're saying to the government, let's come to the table and put our hands, our heads together and come up with something suitable for both parties. And you've got to know your city t-shirt, or what does know your city mean? Basically, <laughs> basically it's about data collection. When we say, I say to the government, we come to you, we know our settlement very well, so we come to you and say, government, here is our settlement, it, it is in need of tabs, because we know that um, in, you are in need of tabs, in a certain settlement, they need of certain tools, so don't say to government, government come here, we need basic services, we actually know how many tabs do we need, how many tools do we need. So that's the question for our government. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And also, <coughs> we influence the policies of the government. Because when we are bringing something to them, we, we initiate things on ourselves in the informal segment and then go and present it to the government so that we can influence their policies to fit what we think is needed to the community. Thank you, thank you. And it just so happens that we have government officials sitting with us right now. So we're going to ask uh, Sarah Watson just to say a few, a few words. She's from Germany as she explained, in the Human Settlements Department. And he wanted to ask her about the partnership and sort of like what kind of innovations in the regulatory framework would be useful to supporting some operating at scale. Sure. Um, we have had a range of um, regulations from national law down to bylaws, which affect this uh, informal settlement upgrading. Uh, some of the works for the benefit of informal settlement dwellers and some works against. For example, in South Africa, evictions are not as widespread, I think, as there are in other parts of Africa because the, of the Prevention of Illegal Eviction Act, um, which requires government to provide alternative accommodation to people who are unable to provide, to, uh, provide their own accommodation in terms of the eviction. Um, but the, a lot of the regulations that we have at local government level, things like uh, Building regulations and our spatial planning laws really work against informal settlement dwellers. Um, we have first world building standards uh, applied in an economy which doesn't enable people to, to uh, build to those standards. Um, and our planning laws, when we do informal settlement upgrading, our planning departments ask us to provide space for two cars to pass each other in between each deck and a parking bay for each house. It's really unrealistic sometimes uh, planning requirements. Uh, so revision of schemes and planning schemes to be more locally appropriate is really important. Um, and at the national level as well, we have um, a grant framework, which is quite difficult to uh, adapt. Uh, our housing subsidy is really uh, this much for a roof and this much for walls and this much for a for floor and it really often doesn't meet the requirements of people and uh, limits our ability as cities to be innovative in terms of the kind of support that we give to informal settlers, uh, settlers to improve their own dwellings. Um, yeah, I think that's... Thank you. That was very helpful. And your city your, uh, is entering into an MOA with the Federation, the Informal Settlement Network, and the Alliance. Why is such a, an MOA of use to city government? Well, we've been building houses since, well, since 1994, we've built 180,000 houses, but the number of people living in informal settlements has steadily increased. So it shows that the programs that we have as government are not meeting the needs of people um, and they're not addressing the conditions that create, we don't like to call them sons in South Africa, that create informal settlements. Um, so we've realized that there are uh, really important gaps in our program, one of which is 
community engagement. We're, we're clearly giving people a product that's not suited to their needs, and we need to be more understanding of what exactly people in informal settlements really need to be able to improve their lives. Um, and another one is that we want to move from a kind of distributive model of development to one that's empowering um, and creating a place for, for people to have a role in their own um, vision and, and goals for themselves and for their communities, rather than something that's just imposed on them, that we in our offices sit and think, this is what people on the ground need. So, partly because of the poor relationships with the community in the past, part, partly because of capacity issues, the city is not necessarily able to do that community engagement uh, without working through intermediary organizations. They really uh, are able to bring us closer to communities because they have those things that have that trust and that relation, those relationships already developed. So we really are looking forward to this partnership, um, which will be coming into action anytime soon. The MOA is about to be signed in the next maybe two weeks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, now, to move over to Charlton, we've been here uh, in this exact room for the last couple of days, and we've been really looking at the sort of really driven data uh, collection work and the way that the partnerships with uh, the city can work to support the development of resilient, um, resilient cities. A bit of a catchy phrase uh, of late, but we wanted to just get a sense from Charlton what he understands a resilient city uh, to be, and then what he thinks uh, the federations and normal settlement networks have to offer in this space. Thanks, guys. So, I think one of the big things that we've been dis discussing and learning about is part of the SDI network, and as Kai said, is the, the new buzzword that's kicked in around resilience. Um, so, we've been unpacking this, and a lot of it speaks about um, how a city can. Um, um, recover from or how it, re how it reacts to shocks and stresses. And um, I think all of you are, are quite aware that in terms of urbanization and in terms of the developed countries of the world, that um, the, the battlefield in terms of where rapid urbanization is happening currently and will be for the next, I'm sure, more than a decade, is happening in informal settlements and slums across the world. And um, a city's ability to um, to absorb and be able to recover from stress and shocks is going to rely a lot on the ability of how they tackle issues that, that occur inside of informal settlements and slums. Because what we find is that when these, especially when shocks come along, we find that a lot of them have a high impact inside of informal settlements and slums. And yet we would say that in the SDI network, our communities, our organized federations and informal settlement networks already have quite a resilient nature to them. They, all, they deal on a daily basis with things like flooding and fires and lack of adequate services. And sometimes this unearths and uncovers quite innovative ways and solutions. Through the STI process, there's a real possibility to link those innovative solutions to um, cities' resilient strategies and help them to actually rethink how they develop these strategies and also incorporate some of the, um, the adaptations that some others have played. I think also, as Sky mentioned, um, with regards to the data that we collect, so a lot of cities do not have sufficient data on the informal settlements and slums that are located inside of their boundaries, yet these often house sometimes the majority of the, of the, um, of the inhabitants for that particular city. So not having that critical information when you are trying to plan for or develop any strategy is actually quite a weakness, and that's one of the big things that we bring to this table is we also bring this data. But I think in the last three days of discussion, we've also highlighted the fact that our data comes with a very unique um, attribute, and that it involves quite a bit of community organizing, which has a lasting impact before, during, and after the state of the society. And, and with that complete understanding and the tools that we have at our disposal, we actually offer cities who are looking to develop resilient strategies a much more holistic approach to what they develop. Because you could easily go down this path and focus on quite formal areas and not actually tackle the issues that, that speak to the majority of residents. Brilliant. Thank you, Charlton. And lastly, we're going to hear from Indodeni, and we're going to hear about peer-to-peer um, -peer exchange, which is one of the most fundamental 
learning tools within the SDI network, whether it be peer-to-peer -peer exchange between settlements in one city, between cities in one country, or between different countries within the SDI network. So, Ndudeni, could you speak a little bit about the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning for urban poor communities? Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Um, I think the learning, uh, the learning exchanges are very important to the leadership because you know when you are sitting in your country or in your settlement and not knowing what is going on to another uh, nearby settlement, it's a poor knowledge. But when you go outside and learn to the nearby people, then you get more of knowledge and you're going to another country to hear their voices because there are different issues between the different uh, countries and different informal segments. And you know when you're going to, we went to uh, Mukuru in Nairobi and we learned the issue of how they can face the issue of flooding. So when they, we learned about the issue of flooding, we took it back to our country, to our South African, when they, uh, there is an issue of a railway people that are, uh, are situated in the railway, so how we can do the relocating or upgrade those people. And the people from uh, Nigeria, they have an experience of eviction, so we learn how they can face the issue of eviction because many uh, people that are living in slums, they are facing uh, by eviction and uh, many issues from uh, the, the, those uh, uh, centers. So doing the local, uh, national and international exchange is giving the leadership the knowledge and the power to do things for themselves where they are staying well as a people. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that was sort of the, uh, the lightning round question and answer that we thought might help you get a bit of a flavor for the work that STI is doing. And um, we're now open to questions from, from your team. Okay, who's going to take that one? So, yes, we do have a lot of challenges. Firstly, we have the scene is believing scenario where governments don't really um, see the value of a community led process. Within partnerships, where government takes a bit longer to understand what communities are basically doing for themselves. And even when they start seeing it, seeing that this process basically works, like one of our challenges is policies. Policies perhaps us on basically going to, to scale from doing things for ourselves because there's always a great type of thing within government. And we also have a lot of challenges with government changes all the time where the people changes, not always the same people that we basically deal with. So it's explaining our story over and over again with different people. Like you, you build a process and you build trust now with this um, sort of official and then later when it changes then you have to rebuild all over and that happens and slows out a community lead process. Also, the, uh, you know, the politicians also play a very big role within our government itself, where basically um, they will do things that suit them and not really suit the community, the community's needs, because it's all about getting votes for themselves and to get in about what they need, the real need of the community. So I think those are some of the challenges that the team can add 
what other challenges are there. Thank you. So now I had a hand up and then press me. Thanks, guys. I think without wasting time, I think um, we might have made a mistake of sharing um, the good story only. But of course, there are, there are other challenges, a number of challenges that we are facing in the process. When we started working with, with municipal in 2008, 2009, we've been pursuing and engaging with the municipalities, wanting to partner with them. It takes time and we're experiencing the resistance in this whole process. But that's why I'm saying we don't necessarily want to share the, the good story only, only because currently there is a relationship or there is a partnership with the city of Cape Town or currently we need the process of signing a memorandum of understanding with the Tegri municipality. It has taken a lot of time. We've been engaging with the Tegri municipality from 2009, but it is only now in 2018 that we are going to be signing a memorandum of understanding. So we are getting hands to that process because we believe that for people to be able to understand this process, you have to continue to engage them. You have to continue convincing them that there is a value in the process of involving people in this whole uh, development and upgrading that Thank you very much. Thank you. Blessing? Okay. Um, and also the other challenge is around um, the issue of officials being changed positions. For example, we are creating terms in a in an MOU or uh, MOA, then we are about to implement get a uh, implementation project, then we get um project uh, manager from the city of Cape Town or whatever city. Before that project is done or in the process of implementation, the new official comes that means we need to you know the board can try to explain with that official how the process is going. If that official does not like one of the process, then it becomes difficult to continue. So this changing and problem of official also affects the these partnerships. I think the last the last the last important <laughs> challenge that we are facing is the political environment I think. Yeah. It it is not easy for people because the process is being politicized. But we believe that now that we are able to catch KZN or Wazunakal or Yedeven and, and, and Western Cape, we are going to spread to other provinces and bring them on board as well. Once they, they, they are able to, they will be able to engage for their, for their own internal exchange program where they learn from each other. We are going to go wide in South Africa. Thank you. Thompson? Yeah, maybe just one last challenge. I, I think what, what we bring to government as the alliance is something that's very unique and it means that often the interface with government is difficult because we ask for something that speaks about partnership and often the municipalities or government that, that we deal with they are used to dealing with contract <coughs> contractors or SLAs but the thing that we're challenging them to do is a partnership where we're actually bringing community and government closer together so that's a little bit difficult to achieve and I think Within the SDI network, parts of the tools, some of the tools that we use is we even take officials and politicians from one country to another so that we can expose them to the methodology and, and so that they can see how partnerships are possible versus just having contractual relationships. And maybe we should hear from Sarah and also ask what does the city experience as challenges with working with other core organizations? Because I know there can be a lot, right? Right. So, uh, there's a range of organizations that represent Earth 4. And some of them are representing the Earth 4, and some of them present themselves as representing Earth 4, but they might have their own particularly political interests. Um, some organizations, have, like the Alliance, have a more developmental agenda. Whereas others are locked in a very kind of oppositional kind of mentality. And uh, I'm not saying that they don't have many things to object to. They do have many valid things to object to about government programs. But some organizations are more interested in building relationships and working together. Uh, others burn tires and streets. Uh, as their way of engagement, and that's really very up to a point. It really it highlights the, the, the critical problems in the area, but it doesn't necessarily uh, work towards solutions. So, and also, I mean, as officials, we also are um, 
We have to take our direction from the elected officials, and the elected officials have quite a cycle, which doesn't necessarily create kind of long-term vision and planning uh, that we as officials are working towards. So short-term goals, long-term goals create some conflicts of interest sometimes, even within the city. So. Thank you very much. Are there, are there other questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for for the comprehensive answers from from your group. And there are three more questions on our side. I recognize that we have a oh, still muted. Still muted. I don't know. It's fine. You can hear me, Sky, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have three more questions. So maybe one or two. So first is for the females on your team, uh, do you face any challenges trying to do community engagement which may, may be different from male um, team members? And the second question is, um, are there communities who are more accepting than other communities in terms of you know, changing or improving the built environment? And I think there's another question, uh, question still being written. So maybe if we can have um, you know, one or two answers to those questions, that would be great. Thanks. I think um, that, uh, <laughs> that doesn't make us men. And it doesn't, we, we, we it, 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 men are resisting us in many ways because sometimes they thought that we want to be men. But because we are soft and we are ladies, but that doesn't give us that softness when we are creating our platforms. Because we have to be equal when we are creating our platforms where we will share what also we have in mind. Because, you know, men is always the, the head of, in, in, in our communities, the men is the head of the, of the house. So whenever they are talking about something or discussing those issues, what they came out with is right. So, but we had a way of knowing and discussing with them and showing them that, no, if we can tackle this in, 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 in this angle, like the savings. Men are not keen on savings. Men are, are very judgmental as people, and they always thought about, I, they will, our money will be charged by this woman. So we have a way of, of like mobilizing them into the savings. Because the men that we are sitting here with are all savers. So today they've changed their mindset. Now they are all well organized women. <laughs> but I think also, uh, I think for us women, we also have to become more strategic when you go into a settlement where you do get some resistance because of different cultures. And because we have to become strategic, we have to start thinking out of the box. So for us, we have more, we have a very difficult task around mobilizing and doing things as women. But, you know, it's not that we just, we just empower or we, we exclude men. But women have sometimes more power and leverage because women are peacemakers. Women are better savers. Women are, are generally very calm in a sense to, you know, when emotions get high in a community. We can just soften and sensitize and, you know, we can bring a different flavor. Um, even when we go to government, it's the same thing. Women are out to cry. Men don't cry easily. So when you go to government, you cry. So there's certain things that women is very unique in doing and getting things out of the community. Um, other than we say there's certain things men can do, but there's a lot of things that women have to actually do much more. Thank you. And also, because like Kazakh and part of Kazakh and it's rural areas. So when we go there, you know, there are chiefs and indunas, and we have to know the culture. When we go there, we sit down, we kneel, we do everything that indunas can accept, and also chiefs that can accept. Before you can enter, there are communities, you need to have an appointment with them and discuss with them, kneeling down, looking down, keeping the culture of that area until you win those people. And then you can open a group 
in the rural areas. As it is, we are going to have a project, big project, with Etewini and the department and also STR, a big project in a rural area. Because we as women, as my partner is saying, we, are, we, we, we look, we cry, we do everything so that it can fit what we want from the men. <laughs> <laughs> then we can win those chiefs and all those who do must. Thank you, thank you. And I think maybe, Undo Daniel, you can tell us about if there are sometimes communities that are a bit more resistant to yeah. change than others. Can you give an example? I imagine it's not easy to enter communities. Yeah. I think yesterday you were telling us some stories from Durban when you tried to mobilize various communities. Yes, there are communities like that, uh, like uh, there are strong gatekeepers in uh, leaders in our communities, then when you go in there, maybe a councillor is other party and peer councillor is other party, so it's very hard to go there and do the mobilization to the community. So when you do go do the profiling, maybe when to do the mobilization, when you go back to do the profiling, they said, no, we don't allow you, then you must go back and do another mobilization for uh, uh, leaders. Not always easy. Yes. Can I just add to that? Yep. One of the things as well is that we have this, uh, people sitting in offices have this idea of communities as this mass of people who all share opinions and are on the same page and are like this, I don't know, cohesive block and that's not necessarily the case where people and communities have different interests. And one of the things that research has recently shown in my province is that 60% of people who live in informal segments have paid for the right to be there. Not paid government, but paid a formal shackle. So they're either paying rent or they're paid to build a shack there. In full sentence, business is this country. And uh, those people have an interest in blocking the government. And they don't, you don't necessarily know who's a shackle to start working. So there's lots of different ways, lots of different industries that exist. It's not like it's just. Uh, this mass of people who all have one opinion and one approach. Absolutely. But also, I think Sky, a lot of communities also resist <laughs> because they don't understand our methodology, because they don't have a sense of understanding what a community lead process is. And I think once they do sometimes get to understand it, then it's easy, then they have a buy-in. But if communities don't basically understand, then they, they resist a lot. So that's why it's important to do these changes to share that information so that they can actually see how other communities change their living condition. Yeah, that trust. I wanted to share that my my leaders have often told me that they use a lot of strategies to try and unlock communities. So even in a bad example where there's a community that's got a lot of big criminal element and then the mobilization strategy actually gets those elements, those people involved in an intimidation process for example, or the profiling, or the mapping, and then they start actually protecting their settlement, um, which is the opposite of what they were doing initially. So there's all kinds of strategies to help them to get back. That's a fascinating, fascinating thing for one of you to write a thesis about. Um, I think Jolie has a few other questions uh, in her hand. I know we have really just run out of time, but what should we do, Jolie? Is fine. Uh, one more question is fine. Um, yeah, so, there's, so there is one more question here. So thank you for an interesting discussion. Please, could you explain how once a community has completed mapping, identifying priority problems, etc., from how please um, sorry, then move to actions to address those problems, especially on financing. Actual implementation or action. So, what kind of challenges have you encountered? 
encountered and you know through those different programs like peer to peer um, travel to other cities and countries um, by members and savings. Uh, the financing of ah yeah okay so uh, where does the funds come from in terms of implementing those problems after you've identified and prioritized through mapping? A couple of concrete examples from the SA Alliance about when you use the information and then you move from the negotiation stage to the implementation of a particular project. Who would like to share an example? Okay. So, firstly, one thing that we've learned from one of our international exchanges from Thailand, which they have a model called Cody, we've developed a city fund. So, because we've developed a city fund where communities can access funds um, much more quicker, much more easier, so that they can basically do their development. But communities have a, a responsibility of also making a contribution, which is basically 20% or 10% of the total cost for the project in order to contribute for them to take the ownership thereof. Then we also, we don't do projects where our municipality or our government don't contribute. They contribute to, to by putting infrastructure. For example, one of our informal settlements that we updated, the community managed to save 90,000 rand and the city probably over two, uh, over two million rand by infrastructure. So I think those, uh, um, responsibilities on both sides of government and communities. And then our process basic, our value that we add is basically making sure that we, we give them the tools in order to implement the project. And yeah, the others can add. Oh, we've got another project that we've uh, done with the city <coughs> from 2011, Chiliwam, Thomas Upgrading the trigger, gun blocking there. Communities um, managed to contribute about uh, 165,000. I, I wouldn't be clear how much millions the city have plowed in that, but a couple of millions that the city have plowed in that um, upgrading in terms of putting infrastructure, connecting the plumbing, and all those things, including electrification of the settlement. And if you go outside um, Cape Metropolitan, Cape Town, the Western Cape, you go to Eastern Cape. We've got um, a sanitation block that is in their community known as um, Midrand. The community has made its own contribution there, and the city has made uh, their own contribution. There are a lot of other projects that are um, happening. We've got a smaller project, which is very close to the town. It's less than five kilometers from town. It is known as Kukuta. That community has done grid blocking as well. There are a couple of other projects that are there that work. City we've made, communities made contribution, and the city has made um, a very big and drastic contribution into those projects. We have also the housing projects that we've contributed because when, when the communities contributed towards their housing, their housing is not the housing that the municipality is receiving, like a 40, 40 square meter, 46 square meter. Their housing are bigger, they are 50 square meter, and what they also, what also is part of the building blocks is that there is the community construction management team. They are being participated. The community is, particip is participating in their own, in their own housing projects, and they are also being capacitated because why? Whenever the project is, is is happening, they are being capacitated. After the project, they've got something that they've got so that they can they for the tool that they can use. Whenever they they want to, 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 to work everywhere because anyway because now they they, they have been trained towards uh, something any 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 part of, of, of the, the project within the housing development. So what they do when when you when you contribute towards your house, you don't sell your house because People that didn't contribute that got free houses from the government are the ones who are selling their houses today. But in, in Federation, you've got a lot of people that have got their houses and they've got participated and, and contributed to their houses and their houses are still their own houses. So there's a lot of, 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 of differences when you saw as people that participate in their own process and pe people that doesn't participate in their process. 
Thank you very much. And I think, I think uh, Jelly, if there are other questions, you could also email them to me. And uh, during the course of the day, I can get answers from these guys and email them back.